Okay, uh, good morning everyone. I just want to check, um, perhaps Heather can just tell me if you can, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, perhaps Heather can just tell me if he is able to see my um, my presentation. Heather, are you able to see it? Hi, Louisa, loud and clear, very nice. Okay, fantastic. Uh, my name is Louisa brown now I'm one of the ENT UCT registrars. Uh, welcome to our UCT Africa um, ENT platform, virtual platform. Thank you to everyone joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to do a, a, a sort of a recap on third window lesions this morning. Um, so let's hope all the technology works well. Kindly mute your microphones on entering the, um, the presentation. Um, shouldn't be too much of a long presentation this morning, but uh, we'll get going nonetheless. So what are third window lesions? They are, in essence, they are bony defects of the inner ear. And they, they enable this sort of abnormal communication with the middle ear and all the cranial cavity. So usually your inner ear and your middle ear are entrained by your oval window and your round window. But when you have a third window, which is this bony defect of the inner ear, you have a, a, quite a lot of loss of acoustic energy through that window. And this creates a pseudo-conductive hearing loss. Um, and it's quite characteristic in that in the low frequencies, you've got this air bone gap um, and you will have decreased air conduction, but an increased bone conduction on your audiogram, which we'll look at a little bit later. So third window um, lesions can affect your vestibular function. Um, and often patients will describe um, or present with symptoms such as vertigo and nystagmus. Um, there are two, uh, there's one phenomenon, one sign that you can pick up clinically. Um, if they have vertigo and nystagmus in response to a loud noise, we call that a tulio phenomenon. Um, or if it's in response to increase in pressure, we call that Hennebert sign. So those are quite useful um, on history and also on clinical examination that you can ask these patients. And really, when we're looking at third window lesions, we want to do a high resolution CT scan. That's your first line modality. MRI, a much more limited role, if any. Um, but really, your high res CT scan is pretty crucial for accurate diagnosis. And obviously, that will direct your management um, depending on what the cause of the third window lesion is. So if we look just briefly at anatomy and imaging, um, the, our inner ear is really defined by a bony labyrinth, and that's um, very nicely periosteum lined. And this labyrinth consists of our cochlea and our vestibular organs. And the labyrinth in the bony aspect is filled with sodium-rich perilymph, and that creates a relative negative electrical potential to the membranous labyrinth. And that's because the membranous labyrinth is filled with potassium-rich endolymph. Now, when you get this environmental stimulus, it creates pressure waves, and um, this is transmitted through the perilymph all the way through to the endolymph, and then you get the stimulation of your cochlear and vestibular receptor cells, which gives us the perception of sound and movement. So this is the anatomy. I'm sure everyone's fairly um, familiar with this, um, but we'll come to the image labeled C in a little bit. But what you can see there is you can see that um, you can see the tympanic canal, the vestibular canal, and the cochlear duct. And within the cochlear duct, that's really where your organ of forty sits. And um, there you have your inner hair cells, which basically convert all this um, energy into impulses that can be received by a um, nerve, and that's then conducted to the brain, which is perceived as hearing, and it pr provides information about um, balance. So when we look at balance, there are lots of vestibular structures that play a role in balance. Um, and this is because we've got polarized hair cells that respond to that different fluid movement in all different kind of directions. Um, our otolithic organs in the vestibule will pick up linear acceleration. And they're the two key role players are your, sac your saccule and your utricle. So your saccule specifically for horizontal acceleration and your utricle for vertical acceleration. Now, these two are both connected by um, ductus uh, utriculosacularis, and this drains via your endolymphatic duct into an endolymphatic sac, and it ends up being blind um, ending, which ends just um, adjacent to the dura mater. So that's really when we're talking about linear acceleration, we're talking about those two structures and the connection between the two. And if we talk about angular acceleration, we know that we've got <laughs> Canals, uh, superior, lateral, and posterior, and they also connect with the vestibular. They give us more information about um, angular acceleration. 
When we talk about sound conduction, we've got these two very important physiological windows. And they are important be uh, because between them, we have a fluid filled inner, and they're the connection between the fluid filled inner and an air fluid middle ear. And the two little wrong players are really your oval window, and that, as we know, contacts your stapes foot plate um, with the vestibule of the inner ear. And that's um, continuous with your uh, perilymph in your cochlea. And the other player is your round window, and that covers the cochlea, and that's contiguous with your scarlet symphony of the cochlea. Now, both the scarlet vestibuli and the scarlet symphony will actually merge at the cochlea apex, and it creates this incompressible column of perilymphatic fluid. Um, and it's this incompressible column of perilymphatic fluid that's responsible for a lot of um, the effects that we have on inner hair cells. These two compartments are separated by scala media, which we know is endolymphatic, not perilymphatic. And in the scala media, as we mentioned before, we've got that very important organ of corti, and that's where your hair cells are capable of um, converting mechanical energy into electrical chemical activity. So just the basis of sound conduction, you've got serous stereocilia that vibrate, um, and this enables mechanical opening of voltage-dependent channels. You then get a depolarization of those hair cells. The neurotransmitters trigger electrical impulses, and then there's conduction through the cochlear nerve or back to the brain, and we perceive that as sound. Now, when there's an inner ear communication with the cranial cavity, this there is usually, we've got these bony fossa, and there is usually cont uh, contiguity between the perilymphatic and subarachnoid spaces, and those are by your cochlear aqueduct, your vestibular aqueduct, and um, all these other small neurovascular foramina. But usually these um, connections are very long and thin bony channels. So your acoustic energy dissipation is actually insignificant when they are long and thin. Nevertheless, even though they're long and thin, um, these channels can actually give you near normal bone conduction hearing, even when your both your oval and round windows are closed. So where they become functionally important is when they are abnormally enlarged, because then you have a much more significant loss of acoustic energy and energy dissipation. So third window lesion specifically is that abnormal communication. It's a communication between your inner ear and an adjacent space. So that adjacent space can be your middle ear or it can be your cranial cavity. And defects in the bony labyrinth, as we mentioned, allows acoustic dissipation. So you get loss of that acoustic energy. And it dissipates away from the regular cochlear vestibular system. And it dissipates it into depending where your third window is. So your middle ear could be your dura mater, or even into vascular structures. And that's really when you get abnormal perceptions in balance and sound, which is what your patients will complain of. So where are third window lesions, um, where do we find them? They can be, um, they can be sort of differentiated by either um, location or cause. Uh, if we look at location, um, third window lesions can sit in round about your semicircular canal, uh, semicircular canals, and we know we've got posterior, superior, and anterior semicircular canals. And um, you can have a third window lesion in your vestibule, near the vestibular aqueduct, and also obviously into the cochlea, specifically scarlet vestibuli. If we look at third window lesions um, and we categorize them according to cause, this is uh, fairly easy for exam purposes. If you just go through your regular dim top acronym, I think you'll be able to um, mention most of these. So third window lesions, if you're looking at causes, it's trauma, surgery, something like cholesteatoma, could be idiopathic, anything that's eroding bones, so neoplasms, previous infections, inflammation, um, congenital malformations, and bony dyscrasias. Um, I think this slide is quite um, quite a good one to just uh, sort of elaborate a little bit on what normally happens in the ear and what normally happens in a third window. So if you look at image A and B specifically, um, with image A, this is your air conduction and this is what normally happens. And in B, this is your third window and this is where the energy is lost. So if you have a look normally in air transmitted sound, you'll have vibration coming through the tympanic membrane uh, traveling along the ossicles, will go through the oval window into the scala vestibuli. Then you get that perilymphatic displacement um, that will 
basically cause an equal and opposite motion of the round window. So you can see that happening there. And that creates your basilar membrane pressure differential. Whereas if you look at third window lesions with your mouse, you see the same sort of process that comes through the ossicular chain into the perilymph. But because you've got these third windows, you get acoustic energy dissipation rather than it being transmitted adequately towards the round window. In bone conduction, um, it's fairly similar. We'll, we'll have a look at that now. The principle is the similar where you get um, dissipation of acoustic energy. So here we have, as we um, described before, here we have um, air conduction um, through that third window. So it means that it says that the acoustic vibration is then directed in another direction, which is away from the oval window. So you get far less energy um, coming to the round window. And that basilar membrane gradient potential is lowered quite significantly. And therefore, you get decreased perception of air conducted sound. So that's all in relation to air conduction. Um, when we look at stereotypical symptoms of patients, um, predominant feature will they'll have a stigma symptom. So this can be directional vertigo, nystagmus, uh, oscillopsia, imbalance, or nausea. Um, we've already spoken briefly about the Tullio phenomenon, and that's when patients, these vestibular symptoms are induced by everyday loud noises like traffic or shouting. Um, in the clinic, you can look for patients uh, with Hennebert sign, and that's because when there's an increased pressure in that sealed external Audrey canal, this induces uh, vestibular symptoms. They could also describe it when they blow their nose, uh, valsalva, or lift heavy objects. Um, they can complain of bony hyperacusis, autophony, where they can hear themselves, um, and they, it can be produced by these dural oscillations, or they might describe that they can hear pulsatiltimitis, um, and then obviously uh, diplocusis. So if we look at the audiogram, um, the audiogram is quite specific for third window lesions, and you'll see we'll cover some of the examples, and most of the audiograms just look like a copy and paste. Um, but in essence, on the, the characteristic audiogram is you get a mixed hearing loss, um, but it's sort of a pseudo-conductive hearing loss. So the characteristic features are that you get an air bone gap. Um, so if you have a look here, you'll get your air bone gap, but your bony conduction is increased. Okay, so you can see it's quite high, and your um, air conduction is, is decreased. Um, and it occurs, this kind of image occurs most significantly at your low frequency, so less than one kilohertz. And that's because at, at less than one kilohertz, um, your acoustic energy is a lot more readily dissipated than at the higher frequency. So that's why you see it more um, pronounced in this area rather than in your higher frequencies. So in your higher frequencies, you'll see little or no air bone gap. Um, because very little acoustic energy is actually shunted away to the third window at the, at the higher frequencies. You can use tympanometry and acoustic reflexes just to help you to check that there's no other um, middle ear pathology causing um, an air bone gap. Um, so hopefully you'll have normal type A tymps and reflexes. We can use vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, which will look at vestibular function. Um, you get acoustic or vibrational input that will stimulate your vestibular hair cells, uh, and this causes compensatory contraction of your cervical facial muscles, and that's then measured by electromyomography. Um, in your third window lesions, as we said, we get the shunt of acoustic energy, and because there's a shunt, you get a much bigger fluid displacement. So you get much bigger uh, deflections of those vestibular sensors, which you can read by doing VIMPs. So VEMP can also confirm directional vestibular hyperexcitability, um, and you'll have much higher response amplitudes and a reduced response thresholds. So if we look at CT imaging, you really want a high resolution CT temporal bone. Your slices should be around 0.5 to 1 millimeter slices. Uh, coronal and sagittal reconstructions are probably the most useful, but they are oblique formats that um, can help you quite a lot, especially in semicircular canal dehiscence. Those two being Stengler's view and uh, partial view, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. As we mentioned before, MRI doesn't really play a primary role in third window lesions. 
Um, we're just going to look at some examples now, um, probably about six of them, and then, um, then that will almost be the end of our talk. But if we look, um, if your pathology is sitting in your superior semicircular canal, and um, this is by far the most common type of third window lesion, and you have extreme thinning or bony loss of the roof of your semicircular canal, you can see that indicated quite nicely in those CT images um, indicated by the white arrows. These are actually those uh, partial extender views. So as you can see, it basically just gives you information of the pathology that you're looking for at a different angle. Um, I must say in our facility, we, we do we do occasionally do extended views, but we don't routinely request these views. Um, but when we talk about semicircular canal dehiscence, as I said, this is the most common. Uh, commonly it can be idiopathic, but there are other causes, congenital acquired, barrier trauma, or even direct mechanical trauma. Can also even be caused by um, CSF uh, pulsations or vascular pulsations that can um, thin that uh, bony roof. You've got to be careful of false positives on CT scans. Um, so on CT scans, when there's really extreme thinning, we need to note that CT has quite limited spatial resolution. So it might be falsely positive and there actually is no dehiscence. Then specifically in your young group of patients, we know that they their um, optic capsules are incompletely ossified. So it might look like a dehiscence, but in fact, it's not a true dehiscence. And this is where these other oblique views um, may help you um, in establishing whether or not there is in fact a dehiscence. And the dehiscence is going to be most um, clinically significant if it's around two millimeters big, and if it's closer to the vestibule. And this dehiscence will go into the gyro mater or even the supraortrosal sinus. And this is the one um, area where your MRI plays a limited role. Um, so although MRI is not recommended for investigation um, as an invest investigation modality for um, third window lesions, in this particular instance, it can have a high negative pre predictive value. That's when you have very thin, it helps you to kind of exclude whether or not there's very thin semicircular canal. So perhaps if you're unsure, MRI does have a limited role, um, but should be the first investigation that you request. Uh, with semicircular canal dehiscence, what are they going to complain of? So they're going to have spontaneous dizziness, they're going to have pressure or sound induced vertigo, as we mentioned before, and they're going to have nystagmus in the plane of the semicircular canal. Uh, your peds uh, population, um, they're probably going to complain more of auditory symptoms, um, and this is a um, and this is a characteristic audiogram. Uh, as you can see, it's not that different from the first example that I showed. If they have really severe vestibular dysfunction, you can consider surgery, and this would entail um, plugging or capping uh, semi the semicircular canal. You have to weigh that up whether or not you would do that or whether you want to try and reinforce your overall loud window. And semicircular canal dehiscence, unfortunately, the symptoms progress over a lifetime. So if they have really severe vestibular um, dysfunction, it is worthwhile considering, considering them for surgery. Um, the audiogram, as you can see, can be misdiagnosed as conductive hearing loss, and you get that characteristic low frequency air bone gap um, with decreased air conduction but supernormal bone conduction. Uh, sorry, just uh, one minute. Mm. Sorry, we're just having a technical issue. Uh. Sorry about that. Okay, I hope you're all with us. Sorry, we just had a bit of an issue with the waiting room. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to posterior surface circular canal dehiscence. Um, and this one particularly is rare. Um, it can occur in isolation uh, or in combination with other semi circular canal dehiscences, but by far the more common one is the previous one that we described. Um, if you could just kindly mute your microphone, that would help us. <laughs> 
Um, so for your posterior semicircular canal dehiscence, it can involve your posterior fossa dura uh, via this bony defect, and um, we can even go in through a high riding jugular valve. Your patients are going to complain of similar things, um, auditory and vestibular symptoms predominantly in the plane of the posterior semicircular canal, and you've got that characteristic um, audiogram that you will be able to see in the image on the right. And um, there's also some CT scans, um, again showing axial and partial views, demonstrating your bony dehiscence um, of that superior limb of that right posterior semicircular canal. You can see that um, illustrated quite nicely with the little white arrows. Lateral semicircular canal dehiscence is also known as labyrinthine fistula. Uh, so we've covered superior semicircular, posterior, and now we're moving on to lateral. Um, now, what's important to note here is that usually your lateral semicircular canal is actually completely covered by a strong bone in the form of the otic capsule. So if you've got isolated lateral semicircular canal uh, dehiscence, you have to understand that this is quite unusual. And there's usually a dysplastic bony labyrinth process happening. There's some other destructive process that's eroding this otic capsule. So there's symptoms, they're going to have their auditory symptoms, their vestibular symptoms in the plane of the lateral semicircular canal. But you've got to be aware that there's probably a destructive process. And this destructive process creates a third window into that lateral semicircular canal, which we call a labyrinthine fistula. Now, these patients are the ones that are going to present with um, what looks like a chronic subcervitis media and possibly even a CSF leak. And anything that's going to erode the optic capsule might cause this. So your infection, your inflammatory processes, um, if you had a difficult surgery, something like CSF hypertension, mm -hmm. and of course, neoplasms. Um, so if we look at the causes of lateral semicircular canal in something like chronic subcutaneous media, um, if you've got a long-term leaking ear, you can actually have demineralization of bone due to um, increased osteoclast activity. The other common thing I'm sure that we all are familiar with is cholesterol. Other examples of things like Langerhans cell histocytosis, uh, where you get very aggressive proliferation of the Langerhans cells. Uh, neoplastic conditions, I think, are fairly self-explanatory, like in your lateral mouse sarcomas. Um, some vascular malformations, like your glomus tumors and paragangliomas. Intracranial idiopathic hypertension. Um, they can develop these labyrinthine fistulas with CSF leaks or even meningeal cell formation. Uh, fractures, and then obviously, iatrogenic. Uh, if we had a difficult surgery, we did a canal wall down, um, you might have injured your lateral semicircular canal. Um, second to last pathology we're going to look at is our enlarged vestibular aqueduct. Now we've recently done quite mapped quite a long presentation on this, so we're not going to focus on this too much. But in essence, the bony vestibular aqueduct will transmit to endolymphatic duct, and this drains from the utricle and saccule into the endolymphatic sac and the perilymphatic duct. And there's communication with the subarachnoid space, and generally your oval morphology is this kind of inverted J-shape. Um, uh, and that's described. Now, normally your bony vestibular aqueduct is long and thin proximally. So it's really effective um, in, with regards to impedance to sound transmission because it's long and thin. But when it becomes dilated, it creates this kind of third window and you have that dissipation of acoustic energy from your inner ear to your posterior fossa or even a high riding jugular. There is a criteria which you can look at for enlarged vestibular aqueduct, such as the Cincinnati and the Bulbasauri. But in practice, when you're looking at CT scans, usually um, you'll have a look at the size um, of the vestibular aqueduct that's adjacent to your inferior limb of your posterior semicircular canal. So that's sort of the approximate size if you were just looking at a CT scan and you weren't using um, the criteria. That's sort of how big it should be. Um, so, if we have a look at the image, you can see that the vestibular aqueduct is slightly enlarged and uh, you can maybe compare it there to the size of your posterior semicircular canal um, and this creates dissipation of acoustic energy. Uh, with the large the vestibular aqueduct, often occurs bilaterally, uh, can run along with other inner ear um, anomalies. I think most of us are familiar with Mondini triad where you have baseball cap cochlea. Uh, there's that non-separation of the middle and apical turns. 
Um, you can have an enlarged vestibule with normal semicircular canals or the dilated vestibular aqueduct. Uh, there is an association with genetic conditions like your pendred, charge, and brachioarterenal syndromes. And the thing about them that's a little bit different to the others is that they can present with very complex and very variable hearing loss patterns. So this is the group that gets fluctuating and progressive sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, the audiogram, you might have diffusely uh, decreased air and bone conduction at low and high frequencies, but actually artifactually, there's an increased bone conduction um, with almost recovery to near normal levels uh, with regards to bone conduction. So maybe this audiogram is a little bit different uh, to some of the other subtypes we've spoken about. And then uh, just the second, I think this is the second to last one. Uh, with regard to cochlear dehiscence, that's basically, there's just a lack of bone over the cochlea and that communicates with your middle ear or other neurovascular structures. Uh, specifically on the scarlet stippy side of the cochlea, um, as we mentioned before, you can think of very many causes of cochlear dehiscence if you go through a dip-top acronym. Um, it creates a fistula and you can have minor or major defects um, of, cochlear, of the cochlear dehiscence and the loss of bone. X-linked state is gushes. Uh, this is basically X-linked deafness um, that is due to a genetic mutation on your X chromosome. Um, and it's really because there's abnormal bone development. It usually presents in boys uh, with early onset, but the hearing loss is quite severe and it, it's definitely progressive. You can have female carriers, uh, but they're going to present with more mild to moderate inner ear malformations and hearing loss rather than very severe progressive hearing loss. If you're thinking about an X-link state, these gusha, they have uh, what they describe as a corkscrew cochlea, um, and there you've got absence of lamina um, cubrosa. So that's why there's a communication between the perilymphatic and subarachnoid spaces. And you can have variable transmission of intracranial pressures. So clinically, you would actually see a mixed hearing loss with a, quite a severe sensory neural component um, because of the corkscrew cochlea. Um, so as we mentioned with X-linked state, these gushes, uh, you can have a mixed hearing loss with a severe sensory neural component. Uh, you'll have a superimposed air bone gap that you might detect in your low frequencies, and that can mimic the conductive hearing loss. So how are you going to manage these patients? Well, if it's only a conductive loss, you might want to consider hearing aids. We don't really do um, safety surgery because we've got a very high risk of CSF leak um, that can predispose you to meningitis and lateral fibers and even further hearing loss. And then if they've got sensory neural hearing loss, you might consider perhaps these patients need a cochlear implant um, as long as you have control of fluid leakage at the time of surgery. Um, and then if we look at some bony, bony abnormalities, examples like would be osteogenesis imperfecta, fibrous dysplasia, and Paget's disease. And wherever you have osteoclast activation, you get pathological bony turnover. And this affected bone, so in these conditions, it's not necessarily just limited to one area, or you can have quite diffuse bony involvement. But um, the bone that has been affected demonstrates much reduced acoustic um, impedance. So it actually acts as a third window, and you can have dissipation of this energy from the cochlea. So you can have the sound hearing loss if it involves your secular chain, um, if, or ear conduction, and or bone conduction, depending on which part of the bone it involves. Uh, you can have superimposed low frequency air bone gaps. And examples of these might be something like otosclerosis, uh, which might be genetic viral autoimmune. Um, and the remodeling might be located only localized only to the otic capsule. Um, and then you also have the fetal otospongiosis is your most common um, location for where this abnormality occurs. Um, so in summary, third window uh, abnormalities have many, many examples. Uh, some of them are far too extensive for the context of this talk. Um, but it's a bony defect of the inner ear that demonstrates uh, an abnormal communication with your middle ear or your cranial cavity. They present with vestibular signs. Uh, they have a pseudo-conductive hearing loss. And with a low-frequency air bone gap, it can occur in lots of anatomical locations. Um, causes can be very varied. 
Um, and you really need a high resolution CT scan um, in order to make the diagnosis and also to decide on what you're going to do for the patient with regards to management. Thank you. Hmm. Um, perhaps we'll just ask if there are any questions or comments from the floor. We've just got a comment from our consultant, Dr. Harris. Hi, thanks, Louise. It was a very nice presentation. And just, you know, we don't routinely ask for those stem bone muscle views, but you can, essentially what you have to do is on your PAC system, you look at the canal in the plane of that canal, if that makes sense, to assess whether it's covered with bone appropriately or not, or whether there's a dehiscence. So that's what we usually do. So for this reason, we don't ask for special views. Um, and then the other thing is, I think, you know, this is kind of one um, condition, so to speak, that uh, one really has to be very cautious about overdiagnosing. So, for example, a patient who has, um, you know, minimal symptoms with, I I've seen patients actually with a bilateral superior semicircular canal disease, or were scanned for some other reason, or were completely asymptomatic. Um, and, and so I think one has to be very cautious about what you attribute to that dehiscence, which symptoms are attributed to that dehiscence and which not. Um, and the other thing is, uh, when one looks at the, which you didn't go into really because, uh, because of time, that when one looks at the treatment for the surgical management of these, uh, to be now that not all the Sorry, not all of the patient's symptoms are going to be resolved with surgery. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those studies, about 50% of them still have uh, uh, some of their symptoms present. So not all of them. Some of them will, will resolve and some of them won't. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Tatiana. Um, always nice to hear from you. There's a little bit of a time constraint. Uh, it's quite an extensive topic. Uh, maybe we can do another topic at a later stage with regards to um, surgical management options. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the floor? Might end the meeting. Thank you very much to everyone that joined us this morning. Um, uh, sorry if we couldn't get if there were any questions that we uh, perhaps may have missed. I don't see any in the chat function. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for joining. We'll have another presentation on Friday morning, and as usual, the link will be sent out the day before. Thanks very much for joining. Uh, I'm going to end the meeting. <laughs>